Mantendo a distância, a vida parece ter um rumo. Mas dentro do fluxo constante de pessoas e ideias, alguns momentos podem mudar tudo. Tomamos milhares de decisões e a partir delas construímos nossas histórias, nossas identidades e nossa sociedade. A ação ou a falta dela determina nosso futuro. Como então separar o que é certo do que é errado? Na política, no trabalho, na filosofia, na vida. Há 30 anos no curso Justiça, na Universidade de Harvard, o filósofo Michael Sandel usa questões do dia a dia para discutir com os alunos os valores éticos. O curso virou livro e uma série de vídeos que se tornou um dos maiores sucessos da internet, vista por milhões de pessoas em todo o mundo. O curso é pioneiro no projeto visionário de Sandow, a globalização da educação. Ele vem ao Brasil em agosto e recebeu o milênio em Harvard para discutir política, corrupção, desigualdade social, democracia e justiça. Well, the main uh, thing that's happening in Brazil is the emerging middle class. Tens of millions of people who are poor who are now middle class. So this emerging, you know, yes. we are very proud of that. Yes. But at the same time, inequality, the deep inequality that existed in Brazil is still there. Right. So you have a very small number of very rich people. It's, it's as if they live in a different country. Mm. There's no sense of community, maybe. Right. There. What do you think of that? Right. Well, the gap between rich and poor is one of the central questions of justice. Mm -hmm. And we see it in many countries, including this one, a growing gap between rich and poor. One approach, one tradition, is the pure laissez-faire, individualist, mm -hmm. free market position, which says, if you buy and sell your skills, your goods on the free market, you are entitled to keep whatever you earn and it would be wrong for the government to tax away your hard-earned money. That's one tradition. Then there's an, another tradition that says, no, that's not true. That inequality often reflects unfairnesses built in to our starting points in society. Some people are born into affluent families, mm. some to poor families. Some have great educational opportunities. Others have little or no chance for a good education. And so the second tradition says the way to think about justice and inequality is for us to ask, all right, suppose you didn't know where you would wind up mm -hmm. in society. You didn't know if you would be rich or mm -hmm. poor, strong or weak, healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Then what principles of justice would you agree to? if you didn't know where you would wind up yourself. So that's the second tradition, and it leads to a more egalitarian mm. system. And then the third tradition I discuss also worries about too great a gap between rich and poor, but for a different reason. Not only out of concern for the unfairness to those at the bottom mm. who suffer the disadvantage, but also out of concern for community. It comes back to something you mentioned a moment ago. According to this tradition, the third tradition, if we have too great a gap between rich and poor, then it's very hard to sustain a sense of community, mm -hmm. a sense that social life is a common project involving shared citizenship, where citizens feel a sense of obligation to one another because they're engaged in a common project. So there is this third tradition that worries about about inequality from the standpoint of social cohesion, mm -hmm. solidarity, and community. Another big subject in Brazil is corruption. Uh -huh. We riddled. Uh, this year, this last year, I don't know how many ministers, six or, uh, I don't know, I forgot the number, six or seven, uh -huh. were ousted because of uh, corruption scandals. Right. So the government is trying to clean its yes. act. Yeah. But uh, it's pervasive. There's mm. a cynicism in mm. Brazil about politics. Mm. Everybody thinks, well, politicians, they all do that. Right. And here, now, the influence of money in politics is increasing. This yes. is going to be the first election since the decision by the Supreme Court to allow yes. corporations to give unlimited money 
to political campaigns. So what are you uh, discussing about that? Well, it, it goes to the question of what is politics as a vocation, as mm -hmm. a calling? What is the purpose of politics? Very often when corruption is rampant and when cynicism is high, there is a widespread sense that politics is really only about self-interest anyhow. And so we can understand, we may not like it, we, we can understand if public officials treat their office as if it were for their own enrichment. Mm -hmm. What that really reflects is the loss of a sense of civic virtue, of public responsibility. And I think one of the great challenges for Brazil, for the United States, for any democratic society is to cultivate, to develop the sense among citizens generally that public life has its own dignity and importance because it really embodies what it is to be a citizen, to be able to have a system of government that we all own that can't be bought by special interests. Now, we, we're now in the United States facing a presidential campaign where enormous amounts of money are being poured into this on all sides. And much of that money is unaccountable. Uh, the candidates themselves even are not um, uh, able to control where it goes exactly. And this too is a kind of corruption, even though it's under the law. Our Supreme Court, as you mentioned, gave a decision uh, recently, a couple of years ago, uh, striking down restrictions um, that limited how campaigns could be financed by private money. And we're seeing the result. And the result is that, that political campaigns are just awash in money, unaccountable money. And that in itself is a kind of corruption, even though it's under the law. It's a kind of corruption of what civic virtue and civic life should be. It's a violation of the deepest ideals, I think, of what democracy is about. The whole idea of democracy is that all citizens are empowered to have a meaningful say, a voice in how they're governed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that in the case of, of our system, we can find a way to limit the role of, of money in political campaigns. The broader issue, though, of cynicism, I think, is we need to uh, we need to create a sense that democratic government is owned by everyone, mm -hmm. and that there's a shared civic responsibility for it, and that's becoming more and more difficult to develop and promote in our societies these days. I think that's why people are so frustrated with politics. One uh, terrible thing that happens here that uh, Brazil is free of that so far uh, is the level of political discourse. Uh, I have been living in the U.S. for 16 years, and, and, and it, it, it was in that period that I saw that happen. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it wasn't like that when I moved here. The shouting matches, yeah. the yeah. you know, the ideological polarization, the it's like uh, every, the other side is evil. Right. It's this terrible situation, and you have addressed that. Yes. So, what is your solution for that? Right. <laughs> right. Well, it is true, and I agree with you, that our politics, our political discourse, consists largely of shouting matches, and there is uh, much too little serious reasoning together in public about big questions. And that's what democratic discourse should be about. I think that our politics has become too narrowly managerial and technocratic and too focused on econo narrow economic questions. And that this has crowded out genuinely political questions, including ethical questions mm. and even spiritual questions that arise in politics. And very often, it's the religious right that wants to bring Vex. questions of values, morality, religion into politics. Mm -hmm. And those on the left 
or those who are liberals say, no, 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 that's coercive, that's intolerant. I think that democratic public discourse should welcome moral and spiritual arguments uh, and that people should not be required, citizens should not be required to leave behind their moral and spiritual convictions when they enter the public square. Now, I'm not saying that we will all agree mm. if we have a debate that is more morally robust, mm. because we do disagree on big ethical questions and moral and spiritual questions. Mm. But I think it's a mistake to pretend that politics can ever be neutral on those big questions. But that's also one example where there could be a common ground. Well, th the area where I would like to begin would be on the question we were discussing before, what to do about the rising inequality. Mm. In the United States, do you know what percentage of the wealth is held by the top 1%? What would you guess? 40%? Yes. So you're very well I informed. Your book. <laughs> you're very well informed. Now, w and Warren Buffett famously uh, said recently that he actually pays less in taxes in a percentage basis than his secretary. Mm -hmm. I would like us, now that's an economic question on the face of it. What should the tax rate be? What should we do about the distribution of income and wealth? But it's not only an economic question. Mm. It's a question of justice. Mm. And to debate it as a question of justice and to do it well requires that we welcome people with different ethical views, different moral and even religious traditions to try to speak about what a just society looks like. Mm -hmm. So what, what we've had a lot in this country is the tendency to think morality in politics, values in politics, that's only about abortion and same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Those are the two issues yeah. that come first to mind here when we think about bringing morality into politics. And usually that means morality is brought in by... And then there's no common ground. Yeah. Polarization. Well, there tends to be. But I... I think we should realize that the big economic questions that we face are questions of justice, they're questions about the good society, and we can't answer those questions without drawing on moral and ethical and spiritual traditions on which people will disagree, but at least we need to learn the habit mm -hmm. of reasoning together in public, of listening to one another, addressing the tr even traditions with which we may disagree mm -hmm. in a way that is consistent with respect. Otherwise, I don't think we're going to address the question of inequality unless we make it a moral question, realize that it's a question of justice, and that everyone has to be free to bring to bear his or her moral and spiritual convictions on those fundamental questions. It's interesting because it's exactly what uh, President Obama did in his campaign. He introduced this discussion of morality into the political discourse, right? It's interesting. He did during the campaign. The campaign. And this was a departure from what many previous liberals or Democrats yeah. had done. They had tended to be more technocratic and more um, uneasy yeah. with moral and spiritual The liberal pressure. tradition is not to talk about religion and morality. Right. And Obama's strength coming out of the liberal and progressive tradition was to say, we can't ignore moral and spiritual questions. It's a mistake if we do, because then that leaves the richest, most powerful moral resources to religious conservatives only. And so he was right about that. Not only was he right, I think it was the source of his inspirational yeah. appeal. Mm -hmm. People want public life to be about things that matter, about big sometimes big moral questions. Mm -hmm. Now, he did that successfully in his campaign. He's not been as successful at translating that moral and civic idealism into governing, into his presidency. Mm -hmm. And the challenge now, I think, for him is to reconnect with that larger moral vocabulary mm -hmm. because that's really what moved people and stirred people and inspired people. 
Well, maybe it's because uh, power uh, always requires a compromise, and uh, you compromise on your moral values too. I mean, who other uh, American presidents were like great moral leaders other than Lincoln? Well, you look at Lincoln. Lincoln is a good example. He brought, if you look at his speeches, his famous speeches, he was very attuned to the moral and spiritual dimensions of politics. That's why we're, we remember him. Um, and uh, so I think, I think real political leadership requires that political leaders and not only welcome moral and spiritual language in politics, but that they encourage in citizens the ability to do that as well, and in a way invite citizens to become philosophers. There's something, I think there's a hunger for that, because too often our politics doesn't let us do that. It's very moving to watch your lectures, to see these young people standing up. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, talking about things that normally people don't talk about. What is the higher good? What is freedom? Um, the, and the fact that you bring to them uh, Aristotle, which is this, this idea of the, the higher purpose. Yeah. There's a word that we, in Portuguese, we say telos. It's from the Greek. Telos, yes. It's as easy for us. Yeah. In English, it's telos, right? Yeah. Um, so t tell us about that. How do young people relate to that idea? What I want first is to present to the students and to the readers of the book the main philosophical ideas that inform contemporary politics, which is for the most part a clash between those who believe in free market property rights libertarian ideas or, or utilitarian ideas, uh, maximizing GDP, and those who say we also have to have a, a decent welfare state uh, to respect the rights of, of the poor, to make sure they don't fall through without a safety net. So those are our familiar debates. Uh, lower taxes, higher taxes, more government regulation, less government regulation. Those are our familiar debates. But then I want to move beyond those debates to remind students that there, are, there is another way of thinking about public life. Aristotle, with his idea of telos, or purpose, says, the telos of political community is not economics writ large. Mm -hmm. It's not just another way of getting what we want as individual consumers. That's, that's, not, that's a market. Maybe it's a big market. Maybe it's a global market. But it's not a political community. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's not, he says, is that political community is for the sake of something higher. It's for the sake of the good life. The reason, ultimately, that we come together in political communities is to make us better, to elevate our characters, to learn how to deliberate with one another, to exercise our human faculty for judgment. Mm -hmm. This is the telos, he says, the telos of political community. And it's connected to our human nature, to what it is, what it is to be a, a human being. His idea is, we couldn't, and I think there's a lot to this idea, we couldn't fully realize ourselves as human beings just living as purely private lives, mm -hmm. as consumers. Mm -hmm. That's not all there is to life. Human beings are shaped by engaging in one another in a common life, deliberating, sharing in self-rule. This affects our character, our mm -hmm. capacity to develop judgment and concern and, and a sense of mutual responsibility for one another. So ultimately, this goes back to what I was suggesting earlier. I don't think we can or should separate questions of the good life from questions of politics and how to govern ourselves. I like that idea of the narrative uh, concept of the subject, that we are yeah. part of a larger narrative. Yeah. Uh, my personal narrative is part of a larger narrative. Yeah. So yeah. explain that. Yeah, and this too comes up toward the end of the book, and the, the end of the lectures. There is a tendency to think that, we, that the highest freedom to be a free human being is to be able to define myself by myself without reference to my past or my tradition or my upbringing or my culture. An abstract being. An abstract being, an abstract self. The pure, 
self-creating individual. There is something very powerful about that idea, but I think it's mistaken. Mm. I think it's an illusion. What it misses is, just as you say, the narrative aspect of identity. Who I am is inseparable from my story, the narrative of my life, which locates me in the world in relation to a past, to a tradition, to a family, neighborhood, community, country, and ultimately to a global society. But the narratives, the stories of those particular settings and identities are part of what make me who I am. That's the narrative conception of the self that I favor as a, it's a kind of counterweight to the kind of radical individualism that we are drifting toward in consumer-driven, market-driven society. You warn your students that uh, uh, moral philosophy, this, all this discussion, is dangerous because yes. after you question the familiar, yes. you'll never be the same again. That's right. After you start to ask what are your motives, right? right? Right, it's true. And students come to me after the class and sometimes years later, and they say, this is exactly what I experienced. Once you begin to question settled, un uh, settled assumptions and conventions, life is never quite the same again. That is the, the danger of doing political philosophy in this way, but it's also the beauty and the exhilaration of it. Because what it means ultimately, I think, to be a human being is to question, to be restless uh, about our assumptions. That's what philosophy is about. And so this sense of being unsettled and uneasy, that's the first step in teaching. It's the first step, I think, in, in civic education, and for that matter, I think, in aspiring to live a good life. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Very My good. Pleasure. Excellent. My pleasure. Very beautiful. Thank you. Para saber mais sobre essa entrevista e deixar a sua opinião, visite o blog do Milênio. Até lá. Música